Like I said, we're going to go through the entire Old Testament tonight. And the reason we're going to do this is I, I really have a burden on my heart now more than I guess ever uh, that I really want you guys to know the Word of God. Um, I mean, not, not that I haven't had this burden before, but for some reason it's just so heavy on me lately. And so I, I, I'm going through the entire thing tonight just in hopes that, that for some of you, maybe you've been at this a long time and, and this will be review for you. And hey, it's never a bad thing to review. Uh, for some of you, it might be the first time you've heard it. I mean, I've, I've been teaching the Bible for, for a while now and it stressed me out trying to prepare. Like, how do I to go through the entire Old Testament? And so it was a review for me as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thing to go through this, but it's just a good thing to really know the Bible, know the Word of God, um, and to understand why it's important for us to know this. Now, the, when, we, when we're talking about the Old Testament, I want to say one thing is that the New Testament is not better than the Old Testament. I've heard some people say, oh, well, the New Testament is for Christians, the Old Testament is for the Jews. Well, that's not the case at all. In order to understand the New Testament, you have to have a good understanding of the Old Testament. You can't, you can't understand one without the other. So, um, and, and let me just say this, as far as the, the Old Testament is concerned, uh, whether or not it's just for um, Jews and the New Testament for, for Christians, Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was a Jew. He was the king of the Jews, right? Uh, so he was a Jewish man here on earth. Um, so what we're going to find as we go through this is that from the very beginning of the Old Testament and all the way through to the very end of the Old Testament, um, what is very well established is that we, people, um, are fallen people, that we are desperately in need of a Savior and we will find our Savior in a person called the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, and you will find that Jesus is all the way through the entire Old Testament. Uh, you can't read the Old Testament without seeing Jesus in it. If, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to find Jesus. So one of the things you'll notice in this form here, and we've just left spaces, you can take notes if you'd like. But all these things in red are are just notes of ways that Jesus is found in these different books of the Bible. So we've broken this down into several groups. So let me explain the groups here. Um, the, the Bible's broken down in the Old Testament, first of all, to the books of the law. Uh, the books of the law are known also in its Hebrew name, the Torah, uh, the Greek name in the Pentateuch, it's also called the books of Moses. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And then after that, you have what's called the historical books, and we find that Joshua through Esther. And then you get after, after that, we look at the poetry and the wisdom. That's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. After the poetry and the wisdom, you'll find that we've got the major prophets, Isaiah through Daniel, and then the minor prophets, which is Hosea through Malachi. Or as every old Calvary Chapel pastor jokes around says, it's Malachi, the one Italian prophet. So I had to throw that in there. Um, if you listen to, to old pastors long enough, you're going to hear that joke. Um, but I'm not old, so I'm just telling you so you know when an old guy tells you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man all right so um, it's broken down into to those books for a very specific reason we're going to go through those tonight um, if you if you have a catholic bible maybe you grew up catholic and you've had the same bible since you were a kid you'll notice that there are some additional books between malachi and the gospel of matthew uh, books like jasher and the Maccabees, and Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, but Ecclesiasticus, um, you, you'll find that there's these additional books. They're called the Apocrypha. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Apocrypha. They're, they're historical books. We find things like the story of Abraham's birth in there. We find stories like the story of Hanukkah is in there, um, things like that. But they're not the inspired word of God. They're simply history books, and so they're not in what's called the canon of Scripture. Uh, the canon is when all the books got assembled into the Bible as we know it. And there are several books that didn't make it in. There's, there's all sorts of books 
that did not make it in that aren't necessarily bad books. They're just not the inspired word of God. If you're interested in the canon of scripture and understanding how the books made it into it, we're not going to go through that tonight because that would take too long. But there is this book, it's called The Origin of the Bible. Uh, If you're interested in that, it's on Amazon. It's a real easy book to get, but I'll warn you, it's not an easy book to read. Um, but it is very thorough, and it, it really, you know, it's very comprehensive. It talks about how the Bible was formed. So if that interests you, that's a good way to find out more about that. Um, another thing to note about these books is they are not written chronologically. And that can be confusing if you start reading, reading the Bible, um, and, and with this idea in your mind that it should be in order, it's going to mess you up. Um, there are all sorts of weird theories that that God created a whole bunch of people before he created Adam and Eve because if you read in Genesis at the very beginning it first talks about God creating all these people men and women you know male and female he created them all these people and then after that he starts talking about creating Adam and Eve and so people think oh well he must have created all those people first and then he created Adam and Eve but that's just not the case Um, so that's why I'm saying we have to understand the Bible is not written chronologically. It's not in order from the time the events took place. Does that make sense? All right, so that'll help us out when we, when we study the Bible. So let's just take a look at the law, the books of the law, the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, or the books of Moses. It begins in Genesis with the story of creation. And like I said, you'll find Jesus is all throughout the Bible. He's right in the very beginning. Um, we see right in the beginning when, when he's, when the earth and everything's being created, and then they make mankind. I say they, as in God, the Trinity. Um, they say, let us make man in our image. And so right there at the very beginning, you see uh, plural form. God is three in one. So there's that story of creation. God created the, the heavens and the earth and all the living creatures on it in six days. And on the seventh day, God rested. That's important to understand at the very beginning because what God did when he, when he worked for those six days and he rested on that seventh is he established a time frame for us. God is um, a God of order. Reading through his word, you see that everywhere. God is not the author of chaos. He's not the author of confusion. God is a God of order. And so right in the very beginning, six days and then the seventh day, a Sabbath day of rest, that began a calendar. And all throughout God's scripture, we see that God uses those seven days, and then he takes those seven days and makes seven years, then he takes seven years times seven, makes 49 with a jubilee year at the end, which is 50. I mean, you'll see that that number seven and the the reason for those Sabbaths is very, very important to God's time frames and all of all of the way God does things in his order. So there in Genesis, we find that story of creation right after creation, Almost immediately, we see the fall of mankind. Um, we're, we're sinful creatures, are we not? Um, that sin of Adam and Eve got passed on to everyone after them, and uh, we we're all born with that sin nature. But right at the fall of mankind, uh, remember at the beginning, God is establishing a lot of things. So he's establishing those seven days. Um, he's also establishing the idea that sin is covered by blood. So we can try to cover up our own sin all we want. Adam and Eve tried to cover it up with fig leaves, but they were just, you know, fooling themselves. There's no way that was going to be uh, a right way to cover themselves up, cover their sin. And so God sacrificed animals and put, put the skins of those animals on them, clothed them with that. But it was by the sacrifice that they were covered. So right at the very beginning, uh, the idea of sacrificing, you know, and blood covering sin, God established that. Um, so fast forward some years, there's people living and dying and multiplying and, and, you know, there's all of a sudden there's lots of people on earth. And one of the things God said was people are sinful, uh, even the very intent of their thought. And if you look at the word for intent of their thought, uh, there in Genesis nine, um, and six and nine, you'll see that, um, that intent is the very form. So even before we think the thought, the thing that forms our thought is, is evil. He said it's evil continually. And so God said he was going to 
destroy the earth. And God always saves a remnant. You'll find that all throughout his word. So he, he commanded Noah to build an ark. That's where we have the story of the flood. And uh, for those, those years that he was building the ark, everybody made fun of him. They were just eating and drinking and give, you know, being given in marriage like nothing was going on. They didn't heed the warning of God. And when that fateful day came, uh, God started to, you know, bring the rains and the floods, and Noah and his family went in, the ark was sealed, and they found their salvation in that ark, in what God provided for them. And so God, all through his scriptures, he, he continues to reinforce this idea that we need to be saved. We have, we have to be saved from our own sinful nature. Uh, but after the flood, what you'll find is people were still sinful, uh, God told them to go out into all the world to, uh, to spread out. He didn't want them staying in one place. And so we find that there was the Tower of Babel. And they started building this tower up into the sky, and they wanted to be like God. And, and God, God had said to, to leave, but they didn't want to. They wanted to have their own way. Um, so God confused the languages at that time. He scattered people out and abroad, and that's how we have the different languages and different cultures that we, what we find today. After the Tower of Babel, we find that God begins, in Genesis chapter 12, he begins the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Abraham's born, he's actually born Abram, and then he changes his name to Abraham. That's another thing you'll notice, is often when God touches somebody's lives, their name will change. So Abraham changed to, I'm sorry, Abram changed to Abraham. Um, later you'll see that Jacob got changed to Israel. Um, Simon became Peter, Saul became Paul, um, all through the word. You'll see that when God touches somebody's lives, oftentimes there's a name change. So um, it begins with Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, if memory serves me correctly. Genesis 12, 3, when God says, I will bless those that bless you, I will curse those that curse you. God was going to make a nation out of Abraham, which was weird because Abraham was already really old. Um, but he did end up making a nation through Abraham. Abraham had, Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob. Um, the, those are the patriarchs of the Jewish people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we see that there's this, this story of, of God forming an entire nation from one man. And um, Jacob, uh, like I said, his name got changed to Israel. Jacob had his 12 sons where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of his sons named Joseph, uh, he was given a dream by God. And the dream wasn't real popular with his brothers because basically the dream interpreted was his brothers were going to bow down and worship him. Or not bow down and worship him, but bow down before him and, you know, and revere him. And they didn't like that, and so they threw him in a pit until they could decide what they were going to do with him. They ended up selling him into slavery and then telling, telling uh, Jacob, telling Israel, uh, their father, that, that basically he got eaten up by wild animals. You know, and, and so Joseph begins this life of being a slave. He ends up in jail. I mean, it's just this long story, but ultimately what happens with Joseph is he ends up being the second in command of Egypt because of a dream that the Pharaoh had, which was really important because there was going to be this great famine, and if God didn't give Joseph favor, Israel's family would have starved, they would have died, and the whole lineage of, of Israel wouldn't have gone on. And so God had his plan, he got Joseph in, Joseph was the second command, and so uh, his brothers did eventually bow down to him, they didn't know who he was, they thought he was, you know, well, they, he was the second in command of Egypt. So they're like, oh, bow down to this guy, and, and uh, it was their brother. So he showed grace to them, and he had food stored up, and they were able to continue on and live and, and flourish. Uh, fast forward some more, and uh, the, the Jews had been in slavery, and God brings along this man named Moses. And Moses was the one who said to the Pharaoh, let my people go. Um, through Moses, brought, God brought about these plagues, uh, multiple plagues that ended with this final plague of um, the death of the firstborn. And with that death of the firstborn, anybody who sacrificed a lamb and put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their home, the angel of death would then pass over that home. 
uh, where we get the Feast of Passover, which we're going to be talking about in that Bible study if you have me over to your home. Um, so that Feast of Passover is something that, that we identify with as Christians because we understand, like I said, that we're looking for this fulfillment of this Messiah. Ultimately, Jesus is that Messiah. He's the Lamb of God. He was sacrificed and we by the blood of that lamb, we're passed over. So the, the Passover was initiated. God brought everybody, all the, all the Jews, out of uh, Egypt, parted the Red Sea. They crossed over, and uh, then they started wandering around. Now, as they're wandering around in the desert, being led by God the whole time, being fed manna from heaven, in other words, just this supernatural food would fall down, and, and they'd have plenty of food to eat. Um, God was leading them around. Uh, they ended up at this mountain called Mount Sinai. And there on, on the mountain, Moses went up and God wrote the law and gave the commandments for all the people. And um, Moses had those commandments. Uh, they were wandering around until God brought them ultimately to a place called Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. You guys have been with us these last several Wednesday nights. We've been going through the book of Joshua, and it's the story of them entering into that land of promise. So um, they're, they're wandering. They're, they're wandering. So just let me back up one second, though. But as the law was given, um, in that, God also initiated the priestly system. Um, the, so there was the, the system of um, sacrifice, and God said, you know, if this sin happened, this is the type of sacrifice that would cover that sin, uh, and he listed pretty much everything out, so that way they knew that, that whole system. So then we fast forward, we get into the next section, so those first five books is basically how the earth was created, it was how God formed this, co you know, covenant with the Abrahamic people, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the, in other words, the covenant with the Jews, um, and bringing them into this place of promise. So then we get into the historical books where we see Joshua. Like I said, we've gone through that already. Um, Joshua's that taking the land, taking the inheritance. And after Joshua, we get into that book called Judges. Now Judges is a book uh, that that I just, I love uh, because it brings me a lot of encouragement. As you read through the book of Judges, what you'll find is people are people and they've been people for millennia. Uh, my point in saying that is what you find in the book of Judges is this, what, what a lot of people call the sin cycle. Uh, they, they sin and they're just doing terrible and they realize, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I've been bad. I've been sinning against God. And so they realize their need for God and their need to be saved. Remember, there's just this thing that God continually reinforces is our need to be saved. So they would realize their need to be saved. And of course, God would save them out of their situation. They would rejoice. And after they're rejoicing and they're so happy, some time would go by of them being good. And then all of a sudden, they sin again. And they're messing up again, and they're doing terrible again. And they go on sinning for a while until they realize, what am I doing? This is terrible. And, and then they call out to God to save them. Does that sound like any of our lives? I hope I'm in good company, because I'll tell you, that sounds like my life. I, I mean, I go through that cycle all the time where, where I'm doing good, and I'm, I'm on it, and things are just clicking and going well, and then all of a sudden I start to slide a little bit like why am I why am I thinking like this why am I doing that and God has to snap me out of it um, so you see that cycle over and over and over and over and over again in the book of Judges um, in the, the book of Judges there's so many different stories there's a story of Gideon uh, you may have read that story or the story of Samson you know the guy with the long hair and he was real strong and you know so many really cool stories are in the book of Judges um, after that, there's the book of Ruth. In Ruth, we see the idea of the kinsman redeemer. Uh, Boaz marries Ruth, and it's a really cool thing because, because of that, uh, we see that their grandson, actually their great-grandson was King David, the, the second king of, um, of Israel. We'll get into that when we get into a couple, uh, two books later. Um, but it's, it's told that Jesus would be in the line of David. Uh, so these two are also in the line because they give, you know, they're, they're the grand, uh, great grandparents to King David. Uh, then in 1 Samuel, we see the story of Israel's first king. 
And it's, it's kind of a sad story because um, what happens is the, the people of Israel, they look around the earth and they see other nations. And as they see these other nations, they go, we want to be like them. You know, at the time, God was their king. God had guided them. Uh, God had brought them through so much. And God had given them so many victories. But they see other people and they go, no, we want to, we want to be like them. And so God warned them, you see, if, if you want a, an earthly king for yourself, if you don't want me to be your king anymore, you want some human being on earth, then here's what's going to happen. And God lists out this entire horrific list of things. He says, if, if you're going to have an earthly king, he's going to do this, he's going to do this, he's going to do this. I mean, it's just terrible stuff. He's going to take your daughters, he's going to take a tenth of what you own, he's going to make your sons, you know, carry, you know, you know, run in front of his chariots. I mean, just terrible, awful stuff. And you know what they said? They said, eh, we want a king anyways. And so God, not forcing himself on anyone, said, okay, well, I'll give you what you want. And he gave them a man named Saul. Uh, it, and Saul was the one they had picked out. And they liked Saul because Saul was tall and strong and handsome and all these things. And they thought, oh, he's definitely the one. And so God gave Saul to them. Well, Saul, being the first earthly king of Israel, was terrible. He was an awful man. And he did things contrary to, to the will of God. He even consulted with sorcery and just awful stuff. Um, ultimately, he and his sons were, were killed and hung on, on the city walls of a, of a city in uh, south uh, Israel, but awful stuff. Um, the whole time this was going on, there was King David, and he was anointed by God uh, to be the, the one that God wanted. He was known as a man after God's own heart. Um, but, of course, Saul didn't like him. Uh, Saul was jealous of him, and uh, David had been on the run. And um, then we see in 2 Samuel, we see David taking over as the king. And um, we see the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, if you don't know that, it's the story where David was standing on top of the palace. He should have been out to war with the rest of the guys, but he had stayed back, and he was looking down, and he saw this naked woman, and she looked beautiful, and he called her over to him. He ended up sleeping with her, but she was the wife of another man that David knew, and he got her pregnant, so then he started freaking out, and he brought this, this guy, his name was Uriah, he brought him back, and he said, hey, you know, sleep, go ahead, sleep with your wife, and no, I'm not going to do that, all the other guys are out at war, and so ultimately, David sent him out with his own death warrant, you know, basically had him killed in battle um, to cover up his sin, and so he's, he's committing adultery, he's lying about it, he's killing to cover it up, I mean, he's just doing awful things. Um, again, you can find some encouragement in that because even through all of that, he was still known as a man after God's own heart. And God still used him for great things. Uh, which means no matter how bad we mess up, God's never finished with us. So long as there is breath in our life, God still wants to do something in our life. That's the grace and the mercy of God. Um, so after, after that, we get into First in 2 Kings, and this deals with the subsequent kings. So you First and 2 Samuel is basically the story of the first two kings, Saul and David, and then after that, um, First and 2 Kings talks about all the other kings after that, um, starting with David's son, Solomon. Solomon was known as the wisest man to ever live and the richest man to ever live, uh, again, bringing me a whole lot of comfort because even as the wisest man to ever live, he still messed up in a great way. I mean, he, he lived a life um, that was just sinful and, and, you know, fulfilling the lust of his flesh. And, um, but still, he was, he was able to build the temple for God, Solomon's temple. Um, he was able to build that and do many great things for the Lord. Um, then you've got First and Second Chronicles after that. Now, First and Second Chronicles covers the same historical time frame of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. Covers that same time frame. Um, it's just it's written after the Babylonian captivity. We'll talk about that in just a, a little bit. But it was written after the cap captivity, um, and it was written as uh, an encouragement to the remnant of Israelites returning after the captivity. And not only that, it was written from the perspective of the priests instead of the perspective of the prophets. So First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, perspective of the prophets. 
First and Second Chronicles, same time period, just perspective of the priest. Um, then we get into Ezra. Uh, Ezra has to do with the rebuilding of the uh, temple worship and the temple walls after the Babylonian captivity. Then you get to Nehemiah, which is a really, really cool story, um, and that is dealing with the building of the walls around Jerusalem. So, um, so Ezra is the building of the temple and the temple worship, and then Nehemiah, the walls that go around it. Um, Nehemiah was a really cool guy. He was a cupbearer for a king, uh, but God gave him favor to go and build the wall, and he did it in a matter of weeks, which is just unheard of. But uh, it was such a great work of God. Everybody got on board, and everybody did something, and uh, they built it in, like I said, a matter of weeks. Um, then Esther, um, the, the Jews wanted to assimilate in Babylon. After the Babylonian captivity, many of them were like, well, no, we'll just stay here. We got houses, we got business, we'll just, we'll just hang out. They wanted to assimilate into Babylon, but God wouldn't allow it. And so we find in that story that God allowed persecution to stop them from assimilating into the Babylonian culture. All right, how are we doing? Good. I know it's a lot of information, but I just want, want us all to have a good grasp of this. Um, let's get into the books of poetry and wisdom. We got Job. Job is the oldest book ever. Okay, so remember I said it's not written chronologically. Um, so Job is not dealing with the story of creation, it's after, but Job was still written before the book of Genesis was written. Um, so it's the oldest book of the Bible. It's the oldest book that, that we have. Um, it talks, you know, the, kind of a, a real good theme out of the book of Job is that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Um, he's a man who had much, uh, but Satan was saying, hey, he only blesses you because he has so much. If you take that away from him, then surely he's going to curse you. And so God allowed these things, his family and his belongings to be taken away from him. Uh, but even still, he said, hey, the Lord gave it to me. The Lord's taken it away. I'm still going to bless the name of the Lord. Um, another cool thing about the book of Job is it debunks people's theory that dinosaurs are millions and millions of years older than human beings, and they were on the earth millions of millions of years before people ever lived. Um, because Job is the oldest book of the Bible, it's really cool to see at the very end of it, it talks about dinosaurs. Um, so, and he writes about the dinosaurs, seeing them walk through the rivers and stuff like that. And so, um, it's a really cool story to share with your kids. And um, like I said, it just debunks what, what, you know, evolutionists want us to believe. Uh, they always want to steer us away from the truth that's found in God's word. Uh, but God's word always gives us the truth. All right, Psalms. Psalms are basically songs. They're, they're, lyrics to a song that somebody wrote to sing to God. So um, over half of these were written by David, the first or the second king of Israel. Uh, he was a harp player. He loved music. He was a shepherd before he became king. So he would be out in the fields. He would write music. Um, the life of a shepherd is a lonely life. Uh, it's just out with the animals and nobody around because it's stinky work and nobody likes it. And so he'd be out there, just him and his harp and his in his flock, and he would write these songs. And then while he was on the run, because Saul was jealous of him and chasing him and wanted to kill him, while he was on the run, he would write songs. And um, then he also write, wrote songs of repentance because he felt so bad about his sins and stuff like that. So um, really cool songs. Basically, as you read through the Psalms, you will find every possible human emotion in the Psalms. Uh, if there's something you're dealing with, whether you're angry or you're hurt or you're frustrated or you're scared um, or you're in love, whatever it is, whatever emotion you can experience as a human being, you will find a psalm about that emotion. Um, and like I said, over half were written by David. Uh, the other half were written by Moses and Solomon and Hezekiah. And then some of them were just unknown. Uh, they were anonymous. Um, but really cool going through the Psalms, and you'll even find as you read th through some of them that some of them are prophetic in nature. In other words, they speak of things that were yet to come. And then we get into the Song of Solomon, the Song of Psalms. I describe this book as steamy. <laughs> it is. Um, I taught about sex one time. Um, I uh, did a whole message all about sex, and I used that book as a book, but I mean, it's, it's steamy. 
I mean, it's, if, uh, if you, if you want to go back in time, you can go and watch that message, but um, it's very, I mean, it, it, ha- it talks about a man just looking at his, at his woman, starting at the top and working his way down and looking at every feature of her body and enjoying that process. Um, and so the idea is that sex was created by God. It's created to be enjoyed. It's not a bad thing. It's not dirty. It's, you know, Satan gets in and he makes it dirty. Um, he, he perverts what God has intended. Uh, but if you're looking to see how did, God, uh, how did God say this is supposed to be, you'll find it in that song of, of Solomon. Um, so, but it's very poetic in nature as well. Then we get into the Proverbs. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Uh, just like uh, Psalms is this book where you, any, any human emotion you can experience, you can find it in the Psalms. Any wisdom you need in how to deal with your wife or your husband, how to deal with your children, how to deal with business, how to deal with a corrupt government, how to deal with your finances, how to, how to be the, the woman God's called you to be. I mean, if, if there's some sort of wisdom you need, you can find it in the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's, it's just jam-packed. Uh, if you're looking to, to gain in wisdom, uh, the book of Proverbs promises that if you ask for it, God will give it to you. Um, and a neat thing about Proverbs, it's 31 chapters, and so um, roughly 30, 31 days in a month, right? And so you can do a chapter a day. Uh, that's a great reading plan if you want to start gaining some uh, wisdom. Then we see Ecclesiastes. Uh, this was written by Solomon in likely his later years because what you find is it's written from the perspective of I've lived my whole life fulfilling the lust of my flesh and what I found is it is empty. Um, it's funny because we have this magazine. I don't even know if it's still around. Is it Vanity Fair still around? Okay. So, you know, the, the idea, you know, is, oh, look beautiful and all this stuff, but but the idea of vanity is that it's emptiness, that is worthless. Um, you know, that, that's just how it is. Um, and Solomon recognized this towards the end of his life. He's like, you know, you could, you could try living your life and trying to be, you know, look good and experience these, these experiences, but what you'll find is your, your ultimate fulfillment has to be found in God. And that's, that's what you find in the, the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, there's warnings in it. Uh, about not making vows lightly to God. Basically, uh, don't, you know, God, what he says is, God would rather you not make a vow to him than make a vow to him and not fulfill it. Uh, parents understand this one. You know, your kids be like, well, I'm going to clean my room, I promise. And then they don't clean their room, right? You would just, I mean, you'd rather them not even tell you they're going to clean their room than tell you they're going to do it and not do it because then you're just frustrated. And God's the same way. He's like, look, don't even make a vow to me if you're not going to, live up to your end. Um, We see in the book of Ecclesiastes God's sufficiency compared with our worldly desires. All right, let's get into the major prophets. So the, the, the books of the prophets, you got the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets are called the major prophets because they are longer and their content has a very broad and even global implications. Okay. Uh, when you look at the, the minor prophets, they're called minor because they're typically shorter and their content is typically more narrowly focused. Does that make sense? Okay. If, any questions? Throw it on that, um, on that number. All right. So let's go through the major prophets. Um, Isaiah, if you could summarize Isaiah in just a word, you would summarize it in the, the name Jesus. Uh, Isaiah points to the, the birth of Christ, it, it prophesies the birth of Christ and the ministry of Christ. Then we look at Jeremiah and Lamentations. I kind of put those two together. Um, you sum those up in one word, it's Judah. Um, he preached about the collapse of Judah and the Babylonian captivity. So I told you we would talk about that later on, so let's talk about it now. Um, God told Israel and Judah, God told them that they were going to be held captive that he had given them warning after warning. Remember I said there was this sin cycle of them just continually to, to fall in sin and him continually having to save them out of it. Um, eventually he says, look, if you don't stop, 
here's what's going to happen to you. Uh, the Babylonians are going to come and they're going to take you over. And that's going to happen for a period of 70 years. And of course, they, they didn't repent. They didn't turn back towards God. God allowed the, the Assyrians, the, the Babylonians to come in. Now, um, it, it sounds cruel, does it not, that God would allow that? Uh, I always paint the picture like this. It's kind of like a dad saying, you know what, if you keep acting this way, I'm going to let the school bully punch you in the nose. And your kid keeps acting that way, and eventually dad says, okay, kid, punch my kid in the nose. It's kind of like that because God's, God used these people that were horrible. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of discussion nowadays prophetically is, is these Babylonians, the, or also known as the uh, Chaldeans, um, that they're, they're the modern-day terrorists. That same spirit that was in them is, is now in the, the terrorists today. They were a brutal people. Uh, they would cut the heads off of their victims and stick their heads on a pole. Same thing that the terrorists are doing today. Um, that same spirit of evilness uh, is, was, that's in the terrorists was in these, these people. Um, so they were brutal. They were, they were hostile. They were, they were just evil people. And God allowed them to come in and take over. I mean, it just shows how serious God takes sin. God does not want his people to sin. He doesn't want us to fall short. He doesn't want us to go against his word. Um, and so in Jeremiah, we see that he, he foretold of this Babylonian captivity. Um, then we, do, we look at Ezekiel. That's the book that we're going to start in two weeks. Ezekiel, uh, if you could summarize that one up, it's in one key word, it's Jerusalem. And you'll find that um, the, first, the first portion of Ezekiel is very historical in nature, and the second portion of, his, of Ezekiel is very prophetic in nature. And um, the, the first part that's historical, it, you know, it's prophetic and historical at the same time in the sense that it was prophetic, but it was also happening because Ezekiel was one of the, the ones caught in the Babylonian captivity. Um, so he, we're going to find as we go through the study that he, um, he's prophesying about things that, that were going to take place and some of them already have. So that's the prophetic historical part. But then he also prophesied about some things that would take place that have not. Um, they haven't taken place. Like in Ezekiel 38, the Gog and Magog invasion that has yet to take place. That's in the end time scenario. Um, and so stuff like that is in the book of Ezekiel. And then we look, um, so Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, those have to do with the Hebrew nations. But then Daniel, that has to do more with the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. Um, we did a whole study on the book of Daniel. If you want to go back and go through that, um, it, it's a great way to, to get through the entire book verse by verse. Um, but one of the main things we see is, is this great image that's set up, this image uh, that changes in its metal. So it starts off with gold and then, you know, then still, or um, gold, then silver, then bronze, and steel, and clay. And, um, you know, in other words, the the, the metals that are discussed in it start off very expensive, very costly, very pure, and then as it gets lower and lower, um, the value, the worth of each of those gets worse and worse. Uh, and that has to do with, like I said, the, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and the, those different empires that would take place. So Daniel was foretelling of, of all these different empires. Uh, and of course, the, the last one was... Um, the, the legs, which was the longest part of the body, which was the Roman Empire, the longest empire to ever live. So he told about the Roman Empire before it ever even took place. Um, another thing in the book of Daniel is the 70 weeks prophecy. And there is the 70th week of Daniel, uh, which uh, when we talk about week, it's, a, it's actually a period of seven years. So um, that's 490 year period, but that 70th week is that seven year period that known as the tribulation period. Um, we're going to see that, that in those 70 years, he talks about the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. He talks about the Antichrist setting himself up uh, to be worshipped in the Holy of Holies. Um, and so when we're looking at prophetic things as far as end times, you'll find a lot of that in the book of, of Ezekiel and Daniel. All right, uh, minor prophets, um, also known as the 12. Uh, so there's 12 minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi. Um, in those uh, minor prophets, uh, the, there's, like I said, there's 12. Nine of them are pre-Babylon, 
Uh, so in other words, pre-Babylonian captivity, pre-70-year captivity, uh, and then the other three are post-Babylonian captivity. So of the, of the nine pre-Babylonian captivity, six of them, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Micah, uh, Micah um, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, they address national problems. Um, for instance, Habakkuk. He, Habakkuk, by the way, is the only book of the Bible that is, is a complete dialogue between man and God. That's all there is in the book of Habakkuk. It's just man talking to God, God responding. Man talking to God, God responding the whole way through. It's really cool. And um, so there, these uh, six of these nine books, they're addressing national problems. So Habakkuk's like, how much longer? And we can kind of identify, at least, you know, I, I can identify, and I'm sure you can if you just watch the news, you can identify with Habakkuk because he's like, Lord, how much longer do we have to see this go on? I mean, perverse judgments are going forth. The law is powerless. People are doing whatever they want. Lord, this is terrible. And what God tells Habakkuk is, listen, I'm doing something in the background. I'm already working something out. In fact, it's so great that even if I were to tell you right now what it is I'm doing, you wouldn't believe me. Uh, and so those, those nine, uh, six of those nine books, those pre-Babylonian books, six of them have to do with those national problems. And there were so many problems. The people had just, they had gone awry. Uh, they weren't living up to God's standard at all. The other three of those nine pre-Babylonian captivity prophets dealt with neighboring problems. So the first six dealt with national, the second three dealt with neighbors. Uh, we find that in Jonah. You guys may have read that story where Jonah got swallowed up in the belly of the great fish. He was in there for three days. Um, remember I said things point to Jesus. Um, you know, Jesus was in the grave three days and then rose again. Jonah was in the belly three days and he came out again, uh, points to, to the idea of Jesus. Um, so Jonah and, and also Nahum, they preached against this city called Nineveh. So that was a neighboring city. They, were, they had run amok. They were, uh, they were just evil. And um, so Jonah and Nahum preached against them. And then Obadiah preached about the inevitable doom of the Edomites. So that's the first nine, the pre-Babylonian prophets, and then we've got the post, the, the remaining three post-Babylonian prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Um, so out of these, these last three, uh, two of them were concerned with Israel's return. So remember, they're, they're post-Babylonian captivity, so the Jews were returning back to Israel, and so um, Haggai, as he was prophesying, he was concerned with the temple of God and what would happen with the temple and worshiping God and restoring that, that temple worship. And then Zechariah was concerned about the truth about who God was. And in Zechariah, you'll find that he had apocalyptic visions. Um, let me just talk about that real quick. Apocalyptic apocalyptic visions. Um, Holly Weird has messed up this word for us. A lot of times when people hear the word apocalypse, they think of doom. They think of, oh, just, you know, the world's going to fall apart. Um, but that's not what apocalypse means at all. Apocalypse is where we get the word revelation from. So when we read the revelation of Christ, we're reading the apocalypse of Christ, the unveiling of Christ. So that way we can see clearly Jesus. Uh, so it's, it's an unveiling, it's a removing of something that hinders you from seeing clearly what you're supposed to see. That's what apocalypse is. Uh, and so Ze um, um, Zechariah was given apocalyptic visions, in other words, visions of, of Christ. Um, then that final one, so the, um, those two, Haggai and Zechariah, they were concerned with Israel's return after the captivity, but Malachi, he was concerned with Israel's relapse. So it's interesting that we begin the Old Testament with this idea of mankind has sinned, they've fallen short of God's glory, they need a savior, uh, and then it ends the Old Testament with Malachi saying, okay, everybody's gone back to worship God, and they're living right right now, but I'm concerned that they're not going to keep living right. Uh, and so it ends there with, with this restart of the people and 
even though there's this restart and people are doing well, they still fall into sacrilege. They fall into witchcraft and adultery and profanity and lies. And Malachi is concerned with that. So he addresses the relapse of the Israel, you know, of the, the Hebrew people. Um, so those are the, the books of the Old Testament. Um, like I said, the entire Old Testament points to Jesus as our Savior. Um, the entire, all, all of the scriptures point, point to this Messiah. And so understanding the Hebrew culture, we understand that what they were looking for, what they were anticipating was this Messiah sent by God. Um, and what we're going to find next week is that Jesus is the one who fulfilled every single prophecy. And there were so many prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, it's undeniable that Jesus is the one that fulfilled all of those prophecies. It's undeniable that we find our salvation in Jesus. And that's the Old Testament. All right. So, Pastor Scott, do we have any questions? That's it? Oh my gosh. All right, we might get more. All right. Okay, let's hear them. Okay. We just got in two more. All right. If, if it starts getting late and you got to go, go ahead and just get up and, and go. We won't call you out. All right. Uh, the first one was, how many prophecies in the Old Testament spoke of uh, Christ's coming, birth, life, death, so on and so forth? I was doing some research on this while we were going through the study, and it's lots, yeah. lots and lots and lots. One source said that uh, altogether there was like 353, um, not all of them in the Old Testament, but anyways, so um, anyways, lots and lots. I don't know if there's, I don't have an exact number on that one. Do you have a? Um, I, I just know it was in the hundreds, um, and, and keep this in mind, uh, there was a mathematician who did uh, just an equation that if, if for Jesus to fulfill just eight of them, and there were like, like we, we said, there's hundreds of them. For Jesus to fulfill just eight of them, the, the ability of him to do that was one to ten to the somethingth power. I, I forget how many zeros there were, uh, but it was described like this. If you were to take a silver dollar and paint it red and then take enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas three feet deep in silver dollars, it would be the same, you know, the, the ability for Jesus to fulfill eight of them would be the same as you being able to walk out into the middle of Texas, reach down and pick up that one for just eight of them. And he fulfilled all of them perfectly. So it's, it's, it's amazing. All right, next one. Was David aware that the Son of God would come through his bloodline? In 2 Samuel 7... Now, the prophet Nathan proclaimed the covenant with God and David that his kingdom would last forever. And so I think the answer is yes. That makes sense? So, prophet Nathan, okay. Uh, did Saul become Paul? Because you mentioned Saul and his sons are ultimately killed. That's the first half of the question. Okay, yeah, so Saul, Saul that becomes Paul is actually in Acts chapter 9 of the New Testament, so you'll probably be hearing about that from this guy next week. Um, so the Saul that's in the Old Testament is a different Saul, um, literally hundreds of years king prior. Saul. Yeah, king, he's King Saul, the first king. Um, Saul that becomes Paul is uh, um, a Pharisee, and he's out trying to kill Christians, and God meets him on the road to Damascus. And the second part on this one was, uh, when was Genesis written if the book is older? I think referring to Job. Okay. So um, Mose, uh, Moses wrote the books of Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy. Okay. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, the books of the law. Uh, so Moses, um, obviously, he was born way after the flood, way after all of that. And so the stories had been passed along, 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 and then Moses wrote them. Uh, so he wrote them way after the book of Job was ever written. But it was because of the oral passing on of these stories from generation to generation. And according to Don Stewart, Calvary Chapel, mm -hmm. uh, he said that that was written between 1500 and 1200 B.C. 
It's whoever asked that one. And they keep coming in. Okay, uh, next one was, is what chapter in Job does it talk about dinosaurs? 49, I, I believe. 40, there's actually two chapters that talk about it, 49 and 50 or 48 and 49. Let me find out for you. Oh, wait. No. I was way off, sorry. 40 and 41. 41. So 40 and 41. So in 40, it's uh, verses 15 to 24, and 41, it's like 1 through 34. So there's two words there, behemoth and leviathan. Um, and it's really cool because it talks about you know, the tail of, of this creature. The tail's like a cedar tree. There's no animal we know other than the dinosaurs that had tails like a cedar tree. Um, or any animals that could walk through the Nile River and you know, not be moved by it. So um, really cool stuff there. Okay, the next one says, can you repeat that? So... <laughs> Not tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not tonight. You have to watch the, the video. Okay. If God hates sin, why didn't he just get rid of uh, all the people in the flood? He knew sin was never going to go away, so why create us in the first place? Okay. So, the idea of God hanging on to a remnant is God wants relationship with human beings. God wants to have a love relationship with us. Uh, he's not going to create people that are going to submit to him no matter what. Uh, what he wants is for us to have what we have, which is choice. Uh, and so we can choose to love him or choose not to. Uh, so he, he gives us that ability to choose. Uh, and he, you'll find it wasn't just the story of the flood, um, but, but all throughout the Bible, there's stories of God keeping a remnant uh, there were so many times where God's people were about to be wiped out and God still saved some. Uh, and there were times where people didn't think that God, God had anybody left. Like Elijah was like crawling, crying out to God, you know, Lord, I'm the only one left. And God's like, huh, you think you're the only one? I got many more of you. You know, there's, you know he's like, I've always got a plan. I've always, I'm always working something. God's always in the background doing something. And so, um, yeah, he, he gives us that choice so that way we can choose to love him. Does that make sense? All right, last one, and I don't know if there's an answer to this. Maybe there is. So why did uh, God change their names after they were touched by God, you know, from uh, Saul to Paul and so on? Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that there's an answer to that. It's just, it's a, um, the way I understand it is it's just something that you'll find in the Word of God is that when somebody's life is touched, um, their life, you know, their name was changed. And oftentimes it, it was changed with um, the word, or the letter H added to it. Um, like Rebecca, K-A-H at the end, or Sarah, A-H at the end. Um, and so it's just that touch of God on their life and their name was changed. Um, remember, in the, in the word of God, people's names meant something. And so when you look at their name, what it, what it was and what it got changed to, um, it oftentimes changed the course of their life and what you know what they were do what they were to do what their purpose was. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right, that was a good job, huh? All right.